Now podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Guadera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, we have a full complement of guests today. We have a full complement today. Today we have Orestes Panayoto, wonderful Greek name, um, who's an epidemiologist and health services researcher and faculty at the Brown School of Public Health. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast, Orestes. Thanks for having me. Nice to, to meet you. And we have Elizabeth White, who is an investigator in the School of Public Health at Brown and a geriatric nurse practitioner. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast, Elizabeth. Thank you. Nice to be here. And joining us from Brazil, we have Marlon Aliberti, who is a geriatrician and clinical researcher at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Welcome to the Jerry Pal Podcast, Marlon. Thank you for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I am super excited about this topic. There has been a lot of discussion about COVID in nursing homes and the high mortality rates. Um, where I live, the vast majority of deaths um, are taking place in nursing homes. And it's hard to actually make sense of, you know, what what does it actually look like as far as mortality rates for nursing home residents? So I'm, I'm really excited um, to have all of you. We're going to be talking about um, a JAMA IM paper that came out called Risk Factors Associated with All-Cause 30-Day Mortality in Nursing Home Residents with COVID. And we've also invited uh, Marlon on to join us because he wrote the editorial, Beyond Age, Improvement of Prognostication Through Physical and Cognitive Function for Nursing Home Residents with COVID-19. So lots to unpack here. But before we do, we always start off with a song request. Who has a song request today? I think that was mine. Since we're talking about um, COVID in nursing homes, which isn't the cheeriest of topics, and we're talking particularly about dying from COVID, I thought we could use something a little uplifting and a song about resilience to begin with. So I chose this little light of mine, which I think is kind of nice. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. That was awesome. Perfect. <laughs> But how it was fabulous, Alex. I mean, maybe at the end, all of our listeners can join us um, singing that song. Well, we can't sing because Zoom actually destroys uh, yeah, you can the try. audio with it. <laughs> yeah, we can try, yeah. <laughs> I think this is a fascinating topic. Uh, with news today out of Europe, the I think she is the second oldest person in the world, a uh, French nun who is 116 years old, survived COVID-19 and is looking to celebrate her 117th birthday on the day of this podcast that's going to be released. Um, so we hear all of these issues around mortality rates and COVID and how bad it is for older adults and how bad it is for nursing home patients that um, I'd really love to depack kind of what this all means. And I loved your article. But before we go into that, like maybe we can just start off with how did you guys get interested in this as a topic? So I can probably just provide a little context of, of how we got involved with this. Early on in, in the pandemic, it became very evident that this was just absolutely devastating nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. Um, and since the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, long-term care residents have represented anywhere from about 7 to 8% of cases, but about 40% of the deaths. And that's been a pretty consistent trend since the beginning. And it also became early evident, or evident early on is that we just didn't have good data to understand what was happening in the nursing homes. So, you know, even back in March and April, you know, the researchers that tend to do research in nursing homes, I mean, we were all scrambling to just get data from state departments of health. I mean, it just wasn't being systematically collected. It wasn't even until May that CMS, uh, you know, the Medicare program began requiring that nursing homes report data to them. So we worked with a, a, a large nursing home provider 
um, that since the beginning has shared all their electronic medical record data with us um, because they really wanted to understand what was happening for their own um, purposes and also just to help advance the science and, and understand what was happening. So this, this is a collaboration that started back in March. We've had a number of papers investigating very various aspects of COVID in nursing homes since then. And, you know, this is a particular paper trying to get into some of the nuances of, of which patients in nursing homes are at greatest risk for, for adverse outcomes, because it's not just a universally vulnerable population. And, and I think uh, our group at Brown is not new to this field. It's not that we just jumped into this opportunity. We have been doing work in nursing homes and long-term care for, for a long time. So uh, this was just a natural uh, extension of our previous work before COVID to tackle another important uh, public health problem in this really vulnerable population. I mean, you go a little bit more into the why. Why is this important? Like, why? Like, we know COVID is really not good in older adults. The every additional decade, um, mortality rates look worse. We know COVID in nursing homes for older adults is even worse. Um, what were you hoping to to really drill down to or accomplish? Uh, so I, th I think one question that hadn't been addressed is exactly how can we stratify these uh, patients? Uh, CDC was putting out some uh, estimates on risk factors, but they were really um, at, at a high level. So no one had really combined them into a single number to try to tell people that, you know, not everyone has all those factors and non has none of those factors. So when you start combining a really big number of individual factors, you get people who are all over the place in terms of the risks. So we want to see more specifically how some of these risk factors look like in the nursing home population and how can we use this information to really identify at a very granular and finer level uh, what the individual risks are. Uh, and, and some potential, uh, for example, implications of why this work might be important or uh, what longer term questions one might answer with this work is you can think of uh, risk-based interventions or risk-based vaccination. Uh, we, we have a, a supply issue right now in terms of vaccines and, you know, people who may want to somehow prioritize who to get, who will get vaccinated. One potential way to make some decision would be to identify those who are at higher risk and prioritize those over someone who might be in the lower uh, end of the risk distribution. And I don't want to, to get technical, uh, but some, some of this is really uh, what are the practical implications of knowing someone's individual risk and how can we stratify patients and target interventions if there is there are constraints in terms of resources, for example. Yeah, and Marlon, you wrote the editorial for this. When you saw that, you know, what they were trying to to do, what did you think this was important? Did you think what you know the the question they were trying to ask was the question you wanted to hear? Yeah, it, it was extremely important. Uh, it's it's interesting that we are as a geriatricians, we are trying to. Uh, uh, fight against ageism, uh, uh, just saying that ageism is a very important his, his factor in COVID-19. Uh, uh, we already know that, but we need to know better how to differentiate among those with similar age, who are those who have high risk. And I think uh, studying uh, uh, a prognosis in a nursing room or in, in nursing room environment, it's the perfect uh, place to understand other factors. And these factors are normally age-related age impairments, as you, you, you notice, related to uh, a cognitive impairment and physical impairment as important risk factors to different age, uh, older people, um, those who can go better and those can go worse after getting COVID. So I think it's an uh, extremely important talk. And can I ask, um, so uh, today's date that we're recording this is Wednesday, February 10th. In the U.S., numbers are dropping pretty dramatically throughout the U.S., definitely here in California. Marlon, can you just describe what, what's happening in, uh, you're in Sao Paulo, right? Yeah. What's yeah. happening in Sao Paulo right now? But we, we are in the second wave in Brazil as a whole. In, uh, Sao Paulo is the biggest city in, in, in Brazil, in South America. So we are having many cases right 
right now, very similar to that we will have in April and May still, we are trying to improve a vaccination to, to try to overcome this, this pandemic. So, but right now we, we have a lot of uh, many cases still. And in nursing homes too? Well, Brazil is, is different from the U.S. and other uh, uh, developed countries. Yes, we have many cases in nursing homes, but we have few older adults living in nursing homes. We have a culture that older people still live with their family. So we have uh, 10% of people living in, in nursing home compared to the U.S., for example. But uh, even having a few people living in nursing home, uh, our mortality rate is very similar uh, to the U.S. and other uh, counties in Europe, for example. That sounds very similar to, to the Greek situation where we keep most of our older adults with family members and try to to minimize nursing home stays as much as possible. Even after an acute hospitalization, that goes to a slightly different topic. But uh, yeah, we uh, nursing homes are not the standard post-acute care setting in Greece. And uh, I'm glad to hear it from, uh, from Marlon as well. Yeah. And for those uh, listeners, um, if you want to hear uh, what a life in the life life is like in a nursing home during a surge and an outbreak, we've had previous podcasts um, uh, back in what was that April, Alex? April. Well, we've had several. Um, yeah, we've had one with uh, uh, Jim Wright, I believe, um, about a podcast in Virginia uh -huh. uh, in a nursing home in Virginia, and then we had another one. Uh, with folks from Indiana University about uh, how things are going there and just devastating impact on nursing homes. Um, how are things in Providence, uh, Rhode Island and the East Coast right now, um, Elizabeth? Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, fortunately starting to come down the peak a little bit. Um, I, I can say, you know, we're looking at the, the nursing home data across all the states that for the provider that we work with, which is about 25 states across the country. Um, and fortunately, we, you know, we are seeing that we're kind of on the other side of the peak. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because that's also coinciding with when all the vaccine, all the vaccine right. started. So the provider that we work with, they've just about finished. So in the United States, most nursing homes are being vaccinated through um, CVS and Walgreens, mm -hmm. um, which is an arrangement where they get three separate vaccine clinics. And that's, that varies in, in some states, but the provider that we work with, they're just about finished with their, their second clinics. Um, and they're seeing pretty good vaccination rates. And we're actually, as part of our work, we're looking to see, you know, we know that cases are coming down, but looking to see how much of that is attributed to vaccination, vaccination. versus just, you know, the, the normal being the other side of the piece. What do you so. mean, Elizabeth, when you say um, three separate vaccination clinics uh, in the nursing homes? So the way they're setting it up, just because of the sheer volume of nursing, I mean, there's 15,000 nursing homes in the country and, you know, the number of nursing homes that have to be vaccinated and the, the residents and the staff in them. So the CVS and Walgreens partnerships, so they essentially, they come in, they do one clinic um, and then they get as many residents and staff as they can during that mm -hmm. first clinic. Then they come back, uh, depending on whether they give the Pfizer or the Mo Mo Moderna in three to four weeks to give oh, I see. dose two, mm -hmm. and then also to give dose one to anyone who did not receive it during the first mm -hmm. clinic. And then they have a few weeks later, they have a third clinic where they come back and they, you know, get the dose twos for the, for the, uh, the people who got their first dose in the, in the middle clinic. So right. Um, it's, it's been quite a logistical operation. Um, and, you know, an important point that's coming up now is that, you know, we've, we're doing a pretty good job of vaccinating the residents, but, um, you know, this is a transient population. People get admitted to nursing homes, people get discharged. So there's going to be a constant flow of people coming into nursing homes, also new staff that come in. So there's going to need to be systems in place to continue these vaccinations over, yeah. over time. It can't just be the three clinics and, and be done. So. Do you have a sense um, from the huge provider that you work with? Is it the largest provider of uh, nursing homes in the country? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, which makes me think that anonymity is not quite as important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I should say, like they've actually, we they've been very transparent, and we've been using their name throughout. So I actually, oh, okay. it's Genesis Healthcare. We've been using their their name throughout our work. I think in this Got particular it. paper, we we didn't, but um, 
they've been transparent about this. Okay. Thank you. Um, and how, how about the staff vaccination rates among staff? Um, has it seemed to be uh, acceptable and our, our, our staff getting vaccinated there were, you know, there's a pub paper published in Jags recently out of uh, the group at Indiana showing that staff were very leery of getting vaccinated. Yeah, and it's certainly been a challenge. Um, there was an MMWR report that came out, uh, I think that was last week, using um, uh, national data from CVS and Walgreens, and then also the national payroll data uh, that only reported about 38% of staff had been vaccinated across the country, not specific mm -hmm. to Genesis. Within Genesis, they just released their numbers, I think, last week or around that time as well. They're seeing vaccination rates around 61% for the staff. So they're um, doing a little bit better. Um, but, I, you know, this is an ongoing challenge and, and there, you know, a lot of investment across, I think, all nursing home providers to educate staff, support staff, um, you know, help them to get to a point where they're, where they're accepting the vaccine because, I mean, that's, you know, the number one priority right now. Yeah, as it should be. Well, let, let's talk about that because, you know, part of the, the role of the vaccine for the staff is to decrease the, what we all often think is the highest risk for dying from getting COVID, the nursing home residents. Can we talk a little bit about the, the, the JAMA study? Can you just get like, in a nutshell, um, what did you guys do in this study? So we, we used, uh, uh, as Betsy mentioned, or Elizabeth mentioned, we used data from about uh, 350 nursing homes in, in the U.S., and uh, we were fortunate to have access both to the electronic medical records of uh, the provider that uh, we collaborated with, as well as uh, MBS assessments that are routinely conducted in nursing homes. So we used information from both of those sources in order to identify uh, risk factors that, uh, based on what was being published at that time, we thought would be important to examine in the nursing home population plus some additional ones uh, like cognitive function and uh, physical function uh, that together can be an indicator of frailty. Um, we you use this because uh, they're not routinely collected at least in such uh, large scale. There may, may be some small studies here and there, uh, some clinical uh, cohorts or case series that people go after patients and do measure those things. but. Uh, in a large scale outside the MDS, it's uh, uncommon to find this information. Um, so we thought to we're going to see how much of uh, how much can we improve our prediction or risk classification of mortality if we add those factors that may be unique uh, indicators of frailty among older adults. How much do we gain if we add them in uh, on top of existing risk factors that we knew we knew already from clinical studies and CDC. And actually, we did see that uh, we can stratify people better, at least older adults in, in nursing homes, we can stratify them better if we just don't consider uh, comorbidities and symptoms, but we also look or incorporate into our assessments uh, measures of frailty. And uh, we saw quite uh, a big of an increase in this uh, risk stratification by adding cognitive function and uh, physical function alone. We have been reading many papers uh, making criticisms against electronic medical records that we, we cannot achieve good information for them. But you choose uh, the opposite. You, you, you had a very good experience in combining different electronic medical records. I, I, I would like to ask you the, the challenges to do that. And if you think in practice, uh, providers uh, can combine those information easily to, to offer better care for older adults in nursing home? Um, I, I think the answer is uh, probably yes and no to some extent. Um, it's, it takes quite some time. So be, there was lots of work that was done behind the scenes uh, by other members of our team trying to combine this information because uh, you know they live in separate data sets sometimes uh, we have to to do some data cleaning to identify these measures so we we really had great support from uh, it colleagues of ours who uh, could really master these data sets and create the information that uh, that we needed um, I, I think part of uh, the answer to your second question is uh, i think it's really up to whoever collects the data to make the extra effort it's def definitely feasible 
to integrate some of these measures in electronic health records, especially if it is a single provider that has access to both you know, assessments of physical function or other health status assessments and the electronic medical records. So most of the time, this ends up being, in, in my experience, it's being, it ends up being a, an IT issue where different systems do not really communicate. The information exists, uh, but we have to make the extra step to combine this information. And then, you know, whoever the user is, it might be, you know, a provider who, like a physician who uses an electronic medical record and that medical record is set up in that way that it can show what is the physical function of that patient over time. And, you know, running a, a, some, some models behind the scenes is not computationally problematic now. Nowadays, the most important issue is how do we allow these systems to talk to each other? You know, looking at your paper, uh, it looks like if you just look at the results, one out of five nursing home residents will die if they get COVID. Then if you add, so that's one prognostic factor. I'm just going to use one. If I add another prognostic factor, in addition to nursing home patients, just age, it looks like if you're less than 65, one out of 20 will die. And if you're greater than 90, um, over one out of three will die. So age seems to be a really important factor. And it sounds like you're saying that there are other things too. Some that you know we may traditionally get, and some like physical functioning, which are a little bit harder in the EMR. When you think about like what you found in this study as far as important factors for mortality, what were they? Wait, wait. Can I guess? I want to yes. guess. Alex is going to guess. You know, I've been reading all these papers about prognostic, uh, you know, prognosis for people with COVID, and Eric's been writing about it. So I think I have a good guess. Um, the first would be, you know, this disease affects the lungs and that's where people get sick. So people with chronic conditions that affect the lungs. So I'm going to go with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as a really important risk factor in nursing home residents. Second would be, we know people who are febrile, right, at high risk for death, or who have low oxygen level, hypoxia. So those are the three I'm going to go with uh, for uh, risk factors for nursing home residents. How'd I do? So you uh -huh. are... <laughs> Certainly right with symptoms. Um, interestingly, we didn't find that COPD was a predictor in this particular population. There are other studies out there that have certain, you know, people that have underlying chronic lung disease, that's certainly a risk factor. Um, the two uh, comorbidities that were strongest associate, had strongest association with mortality in our sample were uh, diabetes and chronic kidney disease. There's been some other work out there that has looked at CKD as being a, a predictor. You know, the underlying mechanisms of that, I think, are still being figured out, whether it's related to underlying inflammation or just, you know, these patients tend to be, you know, have other comorbid illnesses. If it's, uh, you know, we, you know the, ACE and hip, the ACE receptors play an important role in how the virus gets into the cells. So, I mean, it, it was kind of an interesting point that diabetes and CKD were, were the only chronic conditions that, that we identified. Um, we did identify much stronger um, relationship with the level of cognitive impairment and functional impairment. And kind of our hypotheses around that is, one, that these are both important indicators of frailty. And we know that frailty is a geriatric syndrome that in and of itself is an important predictor of mortality. Um, but also it, it goes to the point, and we were talking about staff earlier, or staff earlier, is that people that are more functionally impaired need more help and just, you know, they need to be in, you, you can't, somebody who needs help with bathing and they need help with toileting, I mean, that can't be done in a socially distanced way. So they need more prolonged contact with staff, um, which can uh, potentially influence, you know, the amount of virus that they're infected with, the viral load at, at, at time of infection. And there's been some evidence um, that, you know, that may be related to um, severity of illness. So, you know, there are a couple of underlying explanations there. One, that it's just you know, an indicator of frailty, but then also maybe potentially around the mechanism of how people are being infected. I think another aspect very interesting of the paper that many uh, prognostic papers on COVID um, um, focused on lab tests, on uh, laboratory findings, and doing that in in nursing home, you you could not use that. So you you needed to provide a prognostic information uh, apart from laboratory findings. And I think it was very interesting to show how those information that we can get 
uh, bad side, on the bad side, uh, we, mm -hmm. we can have a good perspective of how older adults can perform after getting COVID. So it's very interesting as well. I was just going to say that that was a, a great point. And I think uh, what uh, you're alluding to perhaps is what is the, the use of having a prognostic tool. Uh, like we can do perhaps uh, a perfect job if we start measuring all those markers, but you know if we need three or four days for the labs to come back, uh, while you know the time that the patient or the staff goes into the patient room, we can measure these things and we can build an electronic tool that tells us what is one's probability. You know, even having a lower or less precise uh, cal calculator can still be very valuable compared to all those fancy perhaps labs that take time to, to come back and you need to put an extra burden on patients by uh, having to draw blood and having, especially in, uh, uh, yeah. during the pandemic, having to have an extra contact might not be the ideal situation. So, so let, let one can ask. balance this. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I work in a nursing home and I know if my patient, what their age is, what their functional and cognitive st status is, Let's say I can put all this in and I, I can get enough. What do I do? What, what should I do with this information? Even just looking at like, okay, I know with if you look at age, cognition, and function, um, that looks really bad individually. Elizabeth, I'm just from your perspective, like, how should I treat the patient differently? Should I should I focus on something differently? What should I do with this information? Yeah, so I think from the clinical perspective, I think knowing these types of factors are really important in terms of prognostication and in terms of having a conversation with, with the resident, with the family about what's the best, both where's the best place to treat the person and, and what are the best kinds of treatment to to provide to that individual. So, you know, a lot of um, residents during COVID, uh, nursing home residents during COVID have been maintained in, in the nursing home because, you know, it's primarily supportive care, um, much of which can be provided in-house. And plus then you're saving the person a, a, you know, a trip to the hospital and, you know, all the, everything that comes along with that. And also just knowing that, you know, this isn't a population that does well in ICUs on ventilators. Um, so I, you know, I, I think having these data and having, you know, the nuance of this helps to inform the discussion with the family, with the resident about where's the, where's the best place to treat the person? Um, is it supportive management in the nursing home? You know, maybe it would be appropriate just put, to put the person in the hospital, um, and, you know, provide some more, more advanced treatment. Um, also we're seeing in, uh, the last month or two an, an increase in the use of monoclonal antibodies within nursing homes, um, here in Rhode Island. They actually administer them through the field hospital that we have set up, and they've developed a pretty efficient relationship with some of the nursing homes. So I think, you know, just making those decisions of, of who may benefit best for different treatments and also just having, you know, a very realistic um, goals of care discussion about um, how to maximize the quality of life um, for a person who is sick with COVID. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, although this paper is about prog uh, prognostication, it can also support uh, how uh, a personal uh, uh, a protective equipment is important for a nursing home. We, we, we have very difficult situations as, as the pandemic starts uh, 12 months or uh, 30 months ago. And um, we see how those with cognitive impairment and physical impairment are the most vulnerable to the pandemic and they need care, a close care. So we should provide uh, a real uh, uh, equipment for the providers and we need to protect our older adults in nursing homes. So I, I think this is a, a, an, an important message of the paper that we can we can get as well. Yeah, and Marlon, it's such an important point. I mean, you know, unfortunately, Back in March and April, the nursing homes were not nursing homes and other long term care settings, assisted living facilities and, and what have you, were, were simply just not given the same priority as hospitals were for for, for PPE. Um, and there were, you know, real supply chain issues that were particularly affecting the long term care sector in those early months. And, you know, those have largely improved. I mean, there's still a number of facilities that are reporting shortages. 
But we have we actually have some related work that we're doing where we're, we're, we're looking longitudinally at mortality rates. And we've seen since the early months of the pandemic that mortality rates within nursing homes have declined. And we have a mm. paper under review, uh, or I'm sorry, a paper that's in press right now that should be coming out um, soon by that that's led by one of our doctoral students, Cyrus Kozar. But, you know, there has been improvement over time and, you know, improvement in PPE supply is certainly part of that. Also, just learning how to manage these, um, this population, you know, potentially changes in the, the, the virus itself. You know, there are a number of kind of different explanations that we're exploring, but it's a very important point. And um, I, I loved your title, Marlon, in your editorial. Um, it was, uh, was it uh, Beyond Age? That there's something more than age. And I think this is this is a tough one. There's a lot of messaging right now. Like, why are we in the U.S. focused on those greater than 75? Because they have a, you know, 300 times higher chance of dying from COVID than those younger than 65. Um, so there's a lot of focus on this is why we're doing this. It, we're kind of being hammered with this idea of age, age, age. We got to focus on age, get the vaccine out as much as possible. Those are 75. Does this study argue that maybe it's, maybe we shouldn't just be looking at age? Maybe we got to look a little bit more at cognitive function, physical function, the environment they're in, like in a nursing facility. Are, and I'm looking at your graphs, age, cognition, and, and function, and man, they, they, they kind of look similar in some ways. Like they seem equally important. Should we be thinking about it more than just age? I think this is a very important aspect. Um, as I said before, we have a lot of ageism uh, during the pandemic, uh, saying that just older people should stay home or should stay, should do physical distancing. And uh, just saying that age is important, we we forgot to to go deeper and analyzing. Uh, older adults as an heterogeneous group of people that uh, we can have older people that that have a very low uh, risk of of mortality uh, despite having uh, been uh, 85 years old so i think this message is very important it's simple but it's very important I guess another question is should we be rethinking how we're doing let's say even vaccinations like should it just be focused on age or should we be thinking about not just comorbidities but you know function cognition prioritizing other groups first uh, so yeah i think that the more information that we can consider to predict to one's you know risk of out, uh, the, the risk of outcome the better it is uh, it's just that we know that most of these you know we can achieve probably some decent risk certification based on age and comorbidities. Uh, or maybe this risk certification might not be the same in younger patients, you know, because the majority of younger patients are not really, may not have physical uh, disabilities or may not have cognitive impairment issues. So you no, do not gain much by adding physical function or a cognitive function in these individuals, while you do gain more in, in older adults. Um, so it, at, at the end of the day, I think it becomes a resource allocation problem. And so, some of the work that we did uh, definitely can inform these decisions. For even the CDC, when the CDC came up with the chart with the different boxes to uh, try to create some ranking, uh, essentially this, this chart implies that th there are some factors that make the different groups uh, have different risks. Now, to what extent the same information can be measured and applied to all, to all. I think that that's an issue that has to do with how do we measure some some things that we think are, are valuable. That, that's what I said earlier, we're lucky that we had this information for our nursing home population, but this might not be easily measurable in the outpatient clinic where someone goes mm -hmm. for their diabetes medications. Right. Right? So uh, had we had this information, probably mm -hmm. things might be different. Um, and it's difficult to say that, yeah, we should consider this if we don't really have the data to, to test some of these mm -hmm. hypotheses. I, I want to push back on this idea a little bit. The San Francisco Chronicle called me a couple of weeks ago and asked me, uh, they said, you know, people with disabilities who are younger are riled up because they are no longer prioritized in California under the new 
distribution policy. It's people over 65 are next. Um, whereas they would have been further up in the queue had they stuck to the original in a multi-tiered complex plan. And I said, look, I'm a, I'm a researcher. I study prognosis. Eric and I have this website, ePrognosis. You know, you all have studied prognosis, obviously. Um, Marlon had a paper about frailty as a prognostic marker. I think that was an age and aging recently. And yet, uh, at this time, we need to invoke a public health ethic. And the ethics in public health, as we've talked about in this podcast previously with Doug White, are different from the ethics of you know, a clinical encounter with a patient in the exam room or at the bedside. And in this case, we need to do the most good for the most people. And I think we can all agree that uh, when it comes to outcomes that are important from COVID, that death is the most important outcome. And it's quite clear that older age is a tremendous marker of mortality and the most uh, important and easily measured marker. Getting back to your point, Arrestus, about what... And maybe you, not the most important from this study, Alex, but the most easily measured because it's yeah. functioning cognition. When I'm looking at their paper... You're, that's look, in nursing homes. In right? nursing you, homes. Because your, your statement before about 300 times the risk was not compared to eight people younger than 65. It was actually compared to people in their 20s. Okay. On the CDC website. So... When you're looking across the spectrum of people who are going to get vaccinated overall, I think, you know, absolutely right to start with nursing homes, one. And then two, absolutely right to continue by vaccinating people, older adults. And that's different, I should note, from what we have talked about on this podcast before, which is rationing scarce treatments for COVID, where we've argued that age, some have argued that age should be included and some have argued that it shouldn't. And I've come to the side that it shouldn't be included and that we should rely on other risk factor risk factors for mortality from COVID alone. But I don't think we can practically have a risk calculator to determine everybody's individual risk and then allocate um, scarce vaccine resources according to the algorithm. We just can't do that. This is public health. We got to do the most good for the most people and build public trust in that system. So that's my pushback against that idea. I'll get off my seat. I think it's a, yeah, I think it's a fair point. And uh, you know, speaking of you know the public health perspective, there are still many, many tiers. For example, nursing home by itself is a risk factor that uh, we haven't really studied, as far as I know. For example, just being in a nursing home, regardless of age, because it's a congregated setting, definitely increases your risk compared to being at home, right? So then we have the comparison between community dwelling people of any age versus older people who are in the nursing home, which is an extra risk factor by itself. Um, so that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a complicated decision based on what we can measure among which individuals and how do we make these allocations? Because uh, the, some of these issues, for example, do exist in renal transplant, right? There is a registry uh, and these are allocation. Again, it's problems that are solved by uh, allocation, resource allocation methods, which go beyond a simple prognostic tool. Like if you have to think of the supply, you have to think of the consequences. If you don't give it to one, what happens to the next person? And, and some of those issues are not always of the same way that, you know, ac across uh, interventions, like a vaccine which has no side effects versus a drug that is metabolized differently in younger and older people. You, we still have to factor these decisions and you know risk and benefits into our decision making yeah. um, and, I, and i would just i mean a i i really love this paper we've been talking about mortality i i think this paper is equally important you flip it around is that you know four out of five people in nursing homes survive covid at least at 30 days less than two out of three people with cognitive impairment or fun, you know functional like People survive, and I think that's a really important part of like having these discussions. And that there's risk factors that increase mortality rates, and that it just highlights the importance of like how to actually have these discussions with patients and family members about risk, and both being honest and hopeful, but also um, realistic, not not fatalistic. Um, not that they, nobody survives, but you know, finding that right balance. And I thought this paper gave me balance. I think another aspect that's very interesting in this paper, although you have done, we, we have selected uh, stud, uh, a population uh, comprising only those with symptomatic COVID-19, 
we have very low prevalence of the typical symptoms. Like, for example, one in five have had a uh, shortness of breath. One in two uh, had fever. But you, you, you have rat selected those with symptomatic, uh, 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 symptomatic disease. So how, how, do you, how do you say something about um, asymptomatic or non-specific symptoms in the nursing home or in the context of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the old saying that like older adults don't read the textbook. Like, I mean, and we certainly have seen that, that you also see, it's not just not manifesting a fever at all, but if they do manifest a fever, you know, the definition of fever in a frail older adult is different than it is you know, for someone like me. Um, so we do see that when they do have a fever, it, it tends to be, you have to use a, lo a lower threshold to classify that. So yeah, when we've, we've have investigated asymptomatic infection in this population as well. Interestingly, we find that about the same proportion of cases in the nursing home population as in the general population, about 40% are asymptomatic. Um, and that kind of opens a whole nother can of worms around, you know, transmission and, um, you know, it really drives home why frequent surveillance and diagnostic testing based on low thresholds of suspicion for, for infection or exposure are so important in the setting because there is so much asymptomatic infection. Were you, so, were you yeah. able to look at delirium? Uh, which uh, I know has come up, you know, confusion. Louise Aronson talked about it on this podcast. You know, why aren't we modifying our criteria for older adults who have different presentations often with things like confusion? Yeah, it's a, it's another great point. And this kind of goes to Arrestus's point about being able to measure it. Um, so we, like the, the tool that we use, uh, well, it, we don't really have a tool to measure, to, like we don't have the CAM or, you know, another delirium tool built specifically into the EMR, uh, we do see, you know, the fairly high proportion of people with COVID that do have, you know, other symptoms documented, you know, agitation or, you know, um, other things that may be symptomatic of delirium, but we don't have a good measure of it. Well, I want to be mindful of time. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. This is a, a outstanding paper, outstanding editorial, Marlon, and uh, really appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you. And I also think you know, one day, even after COVID, um, there will be an after COVID. This is a really important paper to think about. Like, and I think Marlon's editorial really high highlights this is when we think about prognostication, not just relying on age, but thinking about other factors that may be harder mm -hmm. for us to capture in an EMR, but are equally important. So thank you for that knowledge. Probably this is one of the things that can, can stay because COVID most likely is going to stay around even after vaccination. So there will still be people who might be infected. Uh, mm -hmm. So continuing to know one's risk of, of dying once they get infected and have symptoms, I think it's going to be important even if we don't face a pandemic anymore. Right. And there will be other pandemics. Yeah. And the general point sticks yeah. that an older adult's Function is so critically important. Physical function, cognitive function to prognosis for every condition. Yeah. yeah. So like that, that's like the little light of uh, uh, that we need to shine in geriatrics over and over again. <laughs> function and cognition, function and cognition. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. <laughs> Alex, you want to give us a little bit more of that? Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Go, I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Awesome! Thank you all for joining us on this podcast and the amazing work that you do. Thanks so much for having us. And I want to thank all of our listeners for joining us for this podcast and supporting the Jerry Powell podcast. Please rate us on your favorite podcasting app. It certainly helps us. And a big thank you to Archstone Foundation for your continued support. Good night, everybody. Good night.